This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. What I'm going to cover in the next few minutes is um, popliteal artery lesions, and the specific talk is uh, how I decide between atherectomy, stenting, and bypass. And uh, much like instant restenosis, this is a topic that's been sort of an orphan type of issue for many years, but we're in this lucky position that data is beginning to accumulate now that will help us to make uh, make some of these decisions. Uh, these are my disclosures. Um, so I'll just start out by saying what I do, and then I'll come back to it at the end of the talk. Um, so with respect to, um, and again, this is specifically uh, popliteal lesions. So who do I bypass? Well, if I have a patient where the whole popliteal artery is occluded, and especially in addition to the whole popliteal artery, there's reconstitution in the tibials, or it's associated with a very long SFA occlusion, like from the origin. Those are patients that if they need revascularization, I'm thinking of bypass. If I have a patient that I've done what I thought was a really uh, satisfactory endovascular reconstruction, and the patient's failed early, uh, and it's popliteal, I might think about uh, a bypass in that setting. That's not most of the patients. Most of the patients have lesions that are a little bit more isolated, or if they're not totally isolated, they're associated with some other SFA or tibial disease that's not necessarily contiguous. And for those patients, I typically use PTA and selective stenting. And I, although I don't have all the data to back up my opinions, which is why I wanted to just make it clear that this is just my opinion. I'll show you what data we have and then come back to this concept. So along with that, I would say I like to avoid a stent when possible. I like to use modified balloons in the hopes of avoiding extra dissection and thus needing a stent. I do my absolute best not to stent what I think might someday be a, a, a bypass target site. And if I do place a stent, I might think about a supera stent, um, and I'll show you some data about that. It's already been mentioned by um, Dr. Uh, Garrity and uh, also Dr. Owens. So what about atherectomy? Well, atherectomy clearly works in the popliteal. We tend to use it for the focal highly calcified uh, stenoses, ledge-like lesions, or what you want to, you know, usually uh, if it's a food group, you'd say cauliflower. Uh, if it's a mountain formation, you call it a ledge. But these are lesions that are undilatable. In my experience, and with standard nitinol stents, you really can't even expand the stent properly. So in that case, atherectomy is uh, what we think about. And I think, honestly, the use of atherectomy may change a lot if drug-coated balloons turn out to work in concert with atherectomy. The challenge with atherectomy for, for me right now is that I can't show better results and I consider it a little bit more cost, a little bit more radiation, a little bit more effort, and a little bit more risk of embolization. So when you account for all that, you gotta really be able to show an improvement in results, and I don't think we're quite there yet. But then other issues, stent grafts, uh, I think avoidance of covering those perigenicular collaterals is absolutely essential in uh, attempting to keep that patient along the continuum of care that avoids a limb threat situation. And um, also, there are drug-coated balloon studies that are now about to be published, and some of them include the popliteal. So let's get back to the lower extremity. As I mentioned, I think the popliteal is, is often either lumped in with the SFA or completely ignored. We kind of have above the knee and below the knee. But if you separate these three areas, you see that the challenges are different. And the SFA, the sub option, is really realistic and reasonable because we have re-entry catheters, 
Reconstruction is typically reliant upon implants, namely stents. In the popliteal, we have this sense that there's more hostility to implants because of the flexibility around the knee joints. We have the worry of protecting those perigenicular collaterals. And again, when you have a, a popliteal that's occluded in its entirety and you have reconstitution into the, into the tibials, that's a setup for a failed endovascular intervention in, in, my, um, in my experience. So it doesn't mean they're all gonna fail, it's just that that's a very challenging situation. And then lastly, with the tibials, um, we have a much higher incentive to stay true lumen, and we can do that now with CTO support catheters and drilling devices, and the issues in the tibials are, are quite a bit different. We think of them as longer, straighter conduit arteries as opposed to the popliteal. So the popliteal artery anatomy, I mean, we didn't, uh, you know, we think of it as above and below the knee, but the the uh, common, uh, the parlance that's becoming more common, let's, let's say, is to divide it into P1, P2, and P3 segments, with the P1 segment ending at the top of the patella, P2 at the joint, and then P3 down to the tibial trifurcation. Now, whether these areas actually behave differently when treated, we don't really know, but in terms of really understanding, when someone says they did a reconstruction or what segment was involved, I think this is gonna be very useful uh, information. So these are just some of the uh, patients that, that we've treated in the past um, year or so. And here's a patient with a distal SFA P1 occlusion, a P2 occlusion right at the patellar level, a P3 again with reconstitution right at where the AT starts. And then there's an example of a longer one I think the, the patients that have popliteal occlusion in association with either a long proximal or a long distal occlusion, those obviously are much more challenging to deal with. Now the popliteal artery, as I mentioned, um, you know, there's this sense that we have that it's probably a hostile zone, but until recently we haven't had too much science around that. And this is work that was very elegantly done at the University of Colorado looking at just the simple difference between straight leg and cross leg position. And what this is showing is that the popliteal artery changes length substantially just between those two positions and that that difference can be modeled and the modeling is done with, with MRA in normal volunteers. And what you see is that the popliteal is profoundly affected in terms of length increased curvature, twisting, and then flexion points, 10 out of 10 arteries had um, an average of 2.4 flexion points per location. So why is that important? Well, probably for bypass it isn't, but if we're gonna put an implant and we're gonna put a scaffold in there, uh, it probably is important. And then this is um, the kind of math I haven't seen uh, since um, calculus class. But someone is doing high-level math, not me. Someone is doing high-level math and applying it to the popliteal artery and actually looking at, um, at non-diseased or less diseased and, and more heavily diseased. And what you find is that there's more curvature in the popliteal artery with the knee flexed. We knew that. But also in the heavily calcified popliteal artery, there's even more curvature overall. And that can be modeled here with the patients with heavy calcification here in the flex knee position, you see more curvature. So it's a little bit counterintuitive to me, but I think really what's happening is because some segments of the artery are stiff, the amount of curvature is all isolated to specific locations. And if those specific, which we know, which we see when we do bypasses, we find little pockets or segments of softness, and that's where we tend to do our anastomoses. But if we stent those, that really changes the anatomy. And here's just one last study about the uh, behavior of the popliteal artery showing that if you look at native arteries and stented arteries, you see a dramatically different um, behavior when you have, in terms of longitudinal compression, which occurs with the hip and knee both flexed at 90, per, at 90 degrees, what you see is the native artery and the stented artery behaves completely differently as it does in the SFA proximal pop and the popliteal itself. And again, just a little bit more around the mechanics of what actually happens. And so how does this manifest itself? Well, here's just kind of a normal anatomy with the bending of the knee with, with flexion. 
But here's an example of what happens when you put too much stiffness in that place that should allow for curvature and you end up with a kink. And this is um, something that has led to this issue of uh, stent fractures, which uh, at least in some papers is associated with restenosis. Um, and it's just hard to picture something like this and imagine that there's any possible way that that could be good. You could probably argue, well, maybe, maybe the, the person didn't know about it or didn't notice it or something, but it can't be good. So the question is, is the popliteal artery a no-stent zone or not? We've been kind of throwing this around for a few years. And so, um, and then lastly, so what does the task say about the popliteal artery? This is just where the, the popliteal is mentioned and under type B lesions, single popliteal stenosis, type D lesions, uh, chronic occlusion of the SFA that involves the popliteal, or an occlusion of the popliteal artery and proximal trifurcation. So an occlusion of the popliteal is by definition a, a task D lesion. So I wanted to just point out that these are the approval studies for stents of the femoral popliteal segment that have been done in the United States. You can see the life stent, Everflex, Durability, Stroll, Trial, Complete SE, Zilver, and the Supera. And you heard Chris say that the, that the Supera was approved by the FDA this past week. And basically what it shows is that the 12-month primary patency hits a specific range. The length of the lesions runs between five and a half centimeters up to uh, almost 11 uh, centimeters. And the bottom line, one year patency is somewhere between 67 and 86%. These are the trials that have been done, prospective, randomized, or, controlled, uh, or compared with an OPC in the US. So let's go back to the popliteal artery. You'll see that although these are approved for femoral popliteal, that the trials really for the most part include only the P1 segment and the ones that do include have typically a small number, 2%, 15.6%, 7% of the patients have uh, popliteal lesions. Um, if you add in the two drug-coated balloon trials, the SFA2 that, uh, that Chris mentioned is going to be presented at Sharing Cross tomorrow by uh, Gunnar Tepe, um, that one just went to the end of the P1, and the Levant, which uh, Pat, was in, Pat Garrity was involved with, that one included a longer distance. But other than that Levant study, uh, we really don't know what the results are in the popliteal based on the studies that have been done so far in the U.S. So let me just show you a couple of studies that have been done outside the U.S. This is the ETAP study, was recently presented, not yet published. This is popliteal artery lesions, <coughs> PTA versus life stent. Life stent, as you know, was the subject of the resilient trial and was the first uh, approved SFA, or I guess technically the second, but the first clinically useful uh, uh, FDA approved uh, stent in the US. You can see that the lesion length is shorter than SFA. It's in the range of four centimeters. You can see that a third of the lesions were occlusions. And this is the combination of lesions. I mentioned the segments P1, P2, P3, and uh, these patients have a different variety of combinations of these lesions, and a small number had uh, lesion involving the entire popliteal, segments one, two, and three. And this is the result at 12 months, uh, primary patency determined by duplex, 44.9 for PTA, 67.4 for stent. So neither number is terrific. Both of them dealt with lesions that were shorter than what we have in the SFA trials, and neither PTA nor stenting, primary stenting, kind of hit the mark that we expect for SFA. So it tells you something about the popliteal, that a treatment that seems to work a little better in the SFA doesn't work as well in the popliteal. And this is uh, freedom from TLR amputation, death, and MI. This is the PTA group. But these patients here had what was defined in the trial as a TLR, which is that they required selective stenting at that time. And this is the same way the resilient trial was done, as you probably remember. And uh, so if you include that as a failure, the fact that some patients needed a stent, that's what it looks like. But if you include that and call it PTA with selective stenting, you see that the curves are superimposed. So basically what it's saying is that 
PTA with selective stenting appears, in, at least in this trial, which is the biggest popliteal trial to date, looks to do about the same as primary stenting. The Supera popliteal registry uh, published in Jack Interventions comes from uh, Leipzig. And what they did was they looked at 101 patients using this nitinol woven stent that was previously described by Chris Owens. And they had occlusions in almost half the patients. And they had a lesion length that was a little longer than some of the other trials, uh, 5.8 centimeters. And this is their result. The primary uh, patency in this group was 87.7% at 12 months. I mean, that to me is shocking. If that's really true, then this particular stent design, which kind of looks like a slinky when you play with it, has this amazing ability to uh, flex and bend. Um, this may be part of the answer for popliteal. So hold on to your hat, because I don't think we can buy into it just yet. But if it's true, it's really terrific. And this is um, kind of that higher risk group of patients Popliteal stent in patients with critical limb ischemia. This was also using the Supera stent, and they had a 12 month patency in the CLI population of 68%. So, just you know, you show you throw in one nasty risk factor like CLI versus claudication, and the numbers start to drop immediately. So, I'll just briefly summarize the data here. This is the data we have on PTA alone, with, with then added a selective stent when you need it in patients who have popliteal artery lesions. This is the ETAP study that I mentioned. This is a study from Boston University. It's smaller, but well done. And PTA and selective standing, 12 months, 65 to 73%. If you look at atherectomy, um, what you find is, um, what you find is that is there are three series. This one was limited to just the P3 segment. So this is Silverhawk atherectomy at Columbia BU and Columbia again. Patency about the same as PTA and selective stenting. But if you throw in one risk factor, like for example, in this group, these were all occlusions. In this group, these were um, patients with multi-level disease, most of which had occlusions. You see a, an absolute percentage-wise drop of about 10 to 15% right off the bat. And then lastly, primary stents in the popliteal. Data is actually accumulating. Not all these paper, papers are, are published yet. This one here is published, and it comes from Joe Mills's group, who I trust quite a bit. And, and although it's a small number of patients, look at the patency they found at 79% for popliteal artery lesion. So one-year patency of primary stenting ranged from 67 to 87%. So let's go back to what I said initially. So I said that if it involved the whole popliteal or was an early endo failure, I should really think about bypass. But 70, 80% of the patients that show up in my practice that have a popliteal artery lesion that I think needs treating turn out probably to be in this group, which right now, for me in my hands, gets PTA with selective stenting favoring the supera stent. I use atherectomy selectively. And then with these other issues, I mean, it's not that we never use a stent graft in the popliteal, it's just that we want to be super protective of the perigenicular collateral. So I'll just um, throw out a question here about popliteal artery lesions. A, provide a favorable environment for stents. B, can be treated with a wide variety of FDA-approved stents. C, should be treated with angioplasty alone to achieve best results, or D, may be treated with different modalities depending on lesion type, but the results may not be as good as in the SFA. Yeah, so so I, I would agree with that, and I think this issue around the FDA approved stents is that they only cover a short segment really of the popliteal artery. But I think there's some magic in what the Levant study did by being more inclusive of the entirety of the popliteal artery because that's an area where the designers of that study knew that we wanted to avoid implants. So if drug coated balloons turn out to be a better answer then that will be a very nice uh, inclusion for uh, when the FDA evaluates that particular device in the popliteal. Thank you very much.